and wolves. They don't mix. And I think that's the reason that Jesus and Paul utilize sheep figuratively to represent Christians, and then figuratively speaking, wolves as false prophets, including the false prophet, Antichrist. You know, sheep are one of the most helpless animals in God's creation. Without a shepherd to lead them to good pasture, the sheep likely would starve to death. Without a shepherd to keep the sheep from the uh, harsh conditions of weather, the sheep likely would become ill and die. Without a shepherd to protect the sheep from predatory animals, they likely would become dinner for the wolves. And on a spiritual level, and I want you to stay spiritual with me today, on a spiritual level, Christians have a lot more to be concerned about due to the false prophets than physical damage. You know why? Because we're talking about your soul. They don't want your physical body, the wolves I'm talking about, the false prophet including Antichrist. They want to steal your inheritance in the kingdom of God. They want your soul. Well, what's a Christian to do to avoid becoming falling prey to the wolves? Well, Jesus and Paul both gave us some very good warnings and instruction in this matter. Let's begin our study today with the teachings of Christ in, as he delivered the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to pick it up with verse 7. And asking that word of wisdom in Yeshua's name, and chapter 7 of Matthew, verse 7. The teachings of Christ. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Remind you of Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. What are we talking about here, this, this scripture? We're talking about God's Word. And as it's written in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, if you've got that key of David, it opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. So we're not talking here about ask for a new car or ask for a new boat or whatever you might be wanting at this time in your life. What we're talking about is God's Word here. Ask, seek, and knock, and it shall be given to you. The scripture also made me think about those virgins in Matthew chapter 25. You remember the ones that didn't have enough oil, symbolic of truth, and their lamps? And the bridegroom came, and they all went into the wedding, and the door was shut. And then those virgins who went into town to buy truth, you can't buy that kind of oil, came back and knocked on the door. It was too late. Do you remember that? Christ said, get out of my sight. I never knew you talking about seeking his word. Verse 8, For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And you can think of this as wisdom too, I think here. And Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17 came to my mind. Verse 7, excuse me, chapter 8, verse 7. And it states there, seek him, or seek wisdom. Wisdom says, I love those who love me. And if you will seek me early, you will be found of me. In James chapter 5, uh, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 5, God also tells us there through his servant James that if any of you lack wisdom, ask God for it. That's all you have to do is ask God for it, who giveth to all men abundantly. So if you ever find yourself that you think you're lacking wisdom, particularly in our Father's Word. I think it applies even somewhat to the ways of the world, because if you're wise in God's Word, you can become wise in the ways of the world, because it teaches you about the ways of the world. Verse 9, Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Bread always uh, symbolic in God's Word, the bread of life. He is the living Word. We're talking about God's Word again. And what we're going to see here is an analogy here. You know, 
which of you would not give to your children bread, but would, if he asked for bread, something to eat physically we're talking about, but take it to a spiritual level as well, would give him a stone, or a stone of stumbling we might think about. Verse 10, or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? The fish, symbolic of Christianity. The early Christians, when they met, it was very dangerous to be a Christian. And we had that cipher, the Greek word for fish, ichthy. The first letter, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, the symbol of the fish. If you ask your father for Christianity, would he give you a serpent? Symbolic of Satan? Of course not. If ye then, being evil, this means grudging or harmful, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Now, we're not talking about, I'm special. You know, I'm one of God's favorite children, you know. He wants to just give me good things because I'm just such a special child to him. We're not talking about that. We're talking about earning good things. You know, he, he owns everything. In fact, that's the inheritance of God's elect. Our Father, Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 26, and the verses thereafter. They get nothing, the elect. We get nothing in the kingdom as an inheritance except our Heavenly Father. 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law of the prophets. The golden rule of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Love thy brother as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. This means the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, wide is the gate into the kingdom of God, listen, that leadeth to destruction, not into the kingdom of God, and many there be which go in thereat. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, there are two ways, two choices. You can choose good and life, or we can choose death and evil. The choice is ours. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth into life, and few there be that find it. We're talking about eternal life here. And sharpen up for me the reason we came. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets. This word, and those of you with companion Bibles, you've got to note that little word of there can mean even stay away from false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They look like Christians. They're wearing a suit and they're toting a Bible and they're, they're standing behind a pulpit. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. This word ravening, check it out. The prime of it in the Greek is harpazo. And it means to catch up or pluck. These false prophets stand behind the pulpits, which shouldn't be a surprise to us. One of the four hidden dynasties, religion. Satan is using the pulpits of this nation and other nations as well to spread such trot as the rapture theory. Now, listen to this real carefully, what Christ said there. Pay attention to it. Did he say it's going to be like Little Red Riding Hood? The little girl, you know, instantly when she walked up to her grandmother in the bed, said, oh, Grandma, what big eyes you have. What big teeth you have. No, it's not going to be that way at all. That's not what Christ just said. He said they're going to look like Christians, but inwardly their true intention is to catch you up, catch you away. And as we continue our lecture today, their objective is to cost you your crown of glory in the eternity, your inheritance, your very soul. Well, what's a poor Christian to do? I mean, we don't know what their intentions are by their looks, right? That's what Jesus just said. 
How will we know? Verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits, not by their looks. Don't let look, looks can be deceiving, can they not? Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Thorns and thistles, always symbolic of Satan, the bramble. Again, test the fruit. If they say they're a Christian, what are they saying? Are they saying and prophesying out of their own heart, their own mind? Or are they prophesying and teaching from the Word of God? That's how you tell. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. From the beginning of time in God's Word, trees have been symbolic of entities, of man. And it began in the Garden of Eden. We had the tree of life, which is Christ in the Garden of Eden. And we have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is Satan in the Garden of Eden. What Christ is saying here is, don't expect good fruit from a bad tree. A good tree cannot, I repeat, cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. This will never change unless the person changes. I'll throw that in. That's possible. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cut down, and cast into the fire. And we're talking about the lake of fire at the time of Judgment Day. And those false prophets that are telling people you're going to fly away, you don't need to understand the book of Revelations. Guess where judgment starts? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Judgment begins at the house of God. That means with those that profess to be men or women of the cloth. Wouldn't be, want to be standing in some of their shoes. 20. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. That's Christ is telling us there. How can you tell the, the sheep that look like sheep from the wolves? You test the fruit. Verse 21. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. In other words, not every one that professes to be a Christian. That's what calling him Lord, Lord means, is recognizing him as Lord. Shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, let's see. How do we learn the will of God? I mean, has God come to you and told you what His will is, what His plan is? No, most of us probably not. But He did leave a letter to us, a very personal letter to each and every one of you, so that we know His will, His overall plan. Many will say to me in that day, what day are we talking about? We're talking about the Lord's Day, the beginning of the millennium. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Some of them falsely prophesied in his name, celebrating Easter instead of Passover, telling people they don't need to understand God's word, the book of Revelation. And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And they were probably about as effective as the seven sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19, verse 15, at casting out devils. You remember them? They saw all the Christians doing this, so they decided, well, we're going to do that. We're exorcists. Well, they went up to a man that had an evil spirit and said, we adjure you in the name of the Lord to come out. Guess what the evil spirit said? Jesus, I know... Paul, I know, who are ye? And that spirit jumped on those seven boys, and they ran out of there naked and wounded, it states. So these people were about as effective at casting out devils as the seven sons of Sceva. 23. And then, here we have time. When? We're talking about the Lord's Day. Will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work inequity. Get out of my sight. I never knew you. 24. Same thing with those virgins that did not have enough truth, oil in their lamps. In Matthew chapter 25, the door was shut. It was too late. 
Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Notice there is an alternative. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his light house upon a rock. And don't think of this just as a house. Think about it as your life. Have you built your life on the rock? And I'm speaking of Jesus Christ. And the rain descended, and the floods came, the flood of Satan's lies. Revelation chapter 12, verse 15 should come to mind. And the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. Now, did Jesus say, if you'll build your life around me, the rock, is what he's meaning here, that you're going to have a bed of roses all your life, and it's going to be a rose garden, everything's going to be lovely? Guess what? It's hard to be an overcomer if you've never had anything to overcome in your life. God needs people he can trust and he can count on, and he will test them to make sure. And, of course, most of them, the elect, proved themselves in that first world age. But he will test you now as well. But if you're founded in when what is that rock? Christ, the living word. If you're founded in his word, You'll have no problems in life. You realize this life is really nothing but the blink of an eye. When you look at the overall picture of things, there's not much to it. 26. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, here we have an alternative. James chapter 1, we learn, be hear, hear, hearers and doers of the word. There's a big difference, friends. You can hear the word all you want, and it's not going to save you. You've got to do the word. Shall be likened unto a foolish man. This word in the Greek foolish is moros, from which comes our word moron. That's one who there's totally no hope for. Which built his house upon the sand. When problems fall upon them in life, not only their house falls apart, their lives fall apart because they're not founded in the word. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. This word fall in the Greek, crash. Great was the crash of it. Many of these that claim to be Christians, that, God, that Christ was speaking of there, that come to him saying, Lord, Lord, we've prophesied in thy name, we've cast out devils, we've taught in your name. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when they realize that they are spiritually in bed with Antichrist. Some praying for mountains to fall upon them as it's written. 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished. They were amazed, could be translated, at his doctrine, at his instruction. Can you imagine being present and hearing the instruction of, of Christ? We're hearing it right now from his word. For he taught them as one having authority. This means mastery. The master, the living word was standing before them. And not as the scribes. You know who the scribes were, many of them at this time? First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. We learn that the Kenites had snuck in among Judah as the scribes. Even today, we hear it from the pulpits. According to Dr. Smith, so-and-so. According to Brother Brown, this and that, blah, blah, blah. You don't hear according to the Word of God. You hear according to the quarterly that comes out from church, who knows where, somewhere up in the hierarchy of the church. The sheep need protection from time to time. Turn with me for, to John chapter 10, verse 1. And I want you to realize, too, that those of us that have come to the full truth of God's Word have some responsibility as shepherding, as to shepherding the sheep ourselves. What responsibilities do we have? You know, Christ is the shepherd, right? He's, he is the shepherd, there's no doubt about it. But we're going to learn today that we have some responsibilities in shepherding the sheep as well. It's not just our souls that 
I want you to be concerned about, not our inheritance personally. What about all of our brothers and sisters that are lost in this world of darkness? We have some responsibilities to them. I hope you feel it. John chapter 10, verse 1, we're going to start out with a parable. And as often was the case, Christ would state a parable, but they didn't get it. And that's going to be the case here as well. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you the words of Christ, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, we're talking about the kingdom of God here, but climbeth up some other way, how about the Tower of Babylon? You remember them in Genesis chapter 11? They thought they could climb up into heaven. There's going to be another flood. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Let's build the Tower of Babylon and then we can climb up to heaven. Create our own salvation is what we're talking about. The same is a thief and a robber by craft and violence, in other words. They are trying to enter the kingdom of God. There's only one way. There's only one door, as we're going to see. The door is Christ into the kingdom of God. Verse 2. But he that entereth in by the door, he that entereth by Christ, is the shepherd of the sheep. And those of you with companion Bibles note the word the, uh, Bullinger thinks should be a, meaning one of many shepherds. Christ is the shepherd. I don't mean to confuse you, but what I want you to see is you have some responsibilities as far as shepherding the flock as well. Verse 3, to him the porter, or the doorkeeper, openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Do you think the shepherd knows you by name? Isn't that amazing? He does. He knows your name. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, when the shepherd puts his sheep out of the fold, out of the protection, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. Notice who takes the initiative. Well, the shepherd leads them, but he's not going to drive the sheep. He wants you to follow him. And they know his voice. And a stranger, this could be Satan or the false prophets that Jesus warned us about in, in Matthew chapter 7, will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. And you know, Satan will get right up in your ear and talk to you. That's one of his favorite things to do, I think. Is he'll get right up and he'll whisper and tell you how great you are. And that how other people just, they really don't appreciate you as much as you should be appreciated. And you know what? If, 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 if you would just worship me, that's what he wants, you know, is for you to worship him. He promised Christ everything that he could see from that pinnacle he took him up to in Matthew chapter 4. What did he promise you? He'll promise you anything because he wants you to worship him. Verse 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. All too often, I think all of us have a tendency to try and think carnal. We think flesh instead of thinking spiritual. And to understand most of the parables, you better be on a spiritual level or it's going to go right over your head. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the sacred name. I want you to count with me as we go through this next scripture. That's the first, I am. And Jesus is going now explain this parable. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Now, what we're talking about here, the thieves and robbers, are false prophets. He's not talking about Moses and the true prophets of God here. They, they didn't claim anything. Moses and the prophets, in, 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 all the way I'll include John the Baptist, pointed to he that would come. What we're talking about here is the false prophets, for example, at the time that Judah was about to go into the captivity. They said... <laughs> We're not going into captivity. You don't have anything to worry about. 
they were going into captivity. Verse 9, I am, that's twice, the door. He's explaining the parable now. Christ is the door. By me, if, now we have a condition, any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. We're talking about spiritual food, the pasture of his word. And those that can go in and out, what are they? They're free. And when you understand God's word, you are free because truth sets you free. The thief cometh not but for to steal, sometimes to steal your soul, and to kill and to destroy. What's his name in the Greek? Apollyon, Satan's name, the destroyer. I am, that's three times the sacred name, come that they might have life, we're talking life eternal, and that they might have it more abundantly. Well, if, how can you have eternal life more abundantly? Well, if you have the truth of God's word, you're blessed now. God blesses you with things that you want, the good things that we were talking about back in Matthew chapter 7. 11, I am, that's four, the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And he most certainly did on that cross. He paid the ultimate price for us. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, we're talking about those that sit in the pulpits of the churches today, but the only reason they're there is for the money. They're hirelings, they're hourly workers. Not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, seeth those wolves in sheep's clothing, including Satan coming, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. Don't look from that shepherd for any protection. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. This word scattereth is waste them. And make a note of that word catcheth there. We have our Greek word harpazo again, and it means to catch up or to pluck. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. And we're talking about false prophets again, shepherds. 14, I am, that's five times that he says, I am, the sacred name. What is five in biblical numerics? Grace. The good shepherd, and know my sheep, and have known of mine. Unfortunately, many today do not know him, but we're working on that. We're working on that. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. There was a price for that grace that we have available to us today, and that was the blood of Christ on the cross. You know, we're in this world because we have work to do. Uh, Jesus gave some instruction. You can be turning to Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus sent his disciples into the world among the wolves, but he did not do so without telling them and instructing them, how do you handle the wolves, the false prophets, Satan himself? Chapter 10, the book of Luke, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them. What well, we're talking about is apostles here. What does the word apostle mean in the Greek? The very word means to the sent one. So we're talking apostles here, adding to the workforce. Two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Everywhere that Christ was about to go, he sent these 70 two by two. Well, let's see, we've got 70 new apostles. He sent them forth two by twos. How many places did they go to? 35, right? What's 35 in biblical numerics? Hope. He sent them forth to bring hope to the world. The gospel, the good news. Verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, the words of Christ. He didn't just say this to them, he said this to you as well. The harvest, I think spiritual, truly is great, but the laborers are few. 
Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And elect, you are laborers in his harvest. Isn't it wonderful? We, we didn't plant. I mean, some of us have planted, but guess what? It's wonderful that you get to participate in the harvest, and some you didn't even plant. Others planted. Who am I talking about? How about the prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, on and on the list goes. Verse 3, instructions of Christ as he's sending forth those sent ones, the apostles. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And he would add to this, Christ would in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Be ye therefore wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Now, this is how you handle yourself among the wolves. Verse 4, Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. This is a little confusing. What he means here is travel light. Don't take extra shoes. Don't take extra garments. Don't take a begging bag. Verse 5. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace to this house. In other words, make sure the prince of peace is in that house. Verse 6. And if the son of peace be there, in other words, they're Christians, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. This is how you handle yourself among the wolves. If what you are teaching is received, teach. If what you are teaching is not received, don't cast your pearls before swine, as we would be taught in another place. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Again, I think this partially means don't beg. A servant is worth his hire. If you're feeding the sheep God's word, you will be appreciated and taken care of. And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And heal the sick that are therein. They're deserving to be healed. And say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Well, how is the kingdom of God come nigh unto them? Jesus Christ was here on earth. That's pretty nigh, is it not? But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, out into the streets means you make this, this statement public where everyone can hear it. Even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Again, don't cast your pearls before swine. As, as Christ warned us in chapter 7 of Matthew, stay away from the false prophets, the wolves. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. And again, Christ was nigh unto them. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day. What day are we talking about? We're talking about judgment day. For Sodom than for that city. And we all know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre, that's Satan's town, and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. They would have repented if they had seen the miracles. You haven't, and you've seen the miracles. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. They didn't see and those of, of uh, Tyre did not see the miracles. Those the dead raised, the sick healed. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, <laughs> exalted to heaven by themselves, shalt be thrust down to hell. Exalt yourself and prepare to be abased. That means brought low, humbled. Humble yourself, on the other hand, and prepare to be exalted. That's a promise from Jesus. 
He that heareth you heareth me. The same today, friends. And he that despiseth you despiseth me. Also the same today. And he that despiseth me despiseth he, him, I should say, that sent me. Who sent Christ? The Lord. That's dangerous, friend. Despising the Lord. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. That's an important condition. But the point here is, uh, that I want you to see, is Christ gave them instruction. I'm sending you out into among the wolves. Here's how you handle yourselves. Here they're coming back. And they did what Christ said, and everything went well. That's what I want you to get out of this. You do what Christ said, everything goes well. And he said unto them, I behold held Satan as lightning fall from heaven. This is also, of course, prophetic of spurious Messiah being booted out of heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, in the following verses, by Michael and his angels. Behold, I, this is Jesus speaking, given to you power. This is dunamis in the, in the Greek. It means the same word our word dynamite comes from. To tread on serpents, including the Satan. And scorpions, that locust army that can sting as a scorpion, of Revelation chapter 9. And over all the power, this is miraculous, supernatural power here, of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. How could anyone worry or be afraid if they will exercise this power that Christ gave? There's an alternative. You could not exercise that power, and guess what? Satan will invite himself and his into your life. He will eat your lunch. He will beat you up from Monday through Sunday if you let him. The choice is yours. Christ didn't say, I'm going to do it for you, did he? No. He said, I give you the power. Now, how intelligent would have one have to be to take that and say, well, gosh, I've got two choices here. I can let Satan beat me up all the time, me and my family, cause problems in my life, or I can use the power. Use the power, beloved. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, this is but, emphatically, but in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, even the evil spirits, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Is your name written there in that book of life? I hope so, because Revelation 13 tells us if your name is written in the book of the Lamb, which is the book of the life, you're not going to be deceived by Antichrist. The whole world, other than that, will be. Paul warned us of the wolves as well. The same wolves that Christ warned us about. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. And again, I want you to see that we, uh, as learned in God's Word, have some responsibility to shepherd the flock as well. Let's pick it up, uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus, in the Greek this is actually pronounced Miletos, and less correctly called Miletum in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, according to the Smiths. The point being, this place lied about 36 miles south of Ephesus, the home to the Ephesians. He sent, now don't miss that, Paul didn't go to Ephesus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And it's thought the time taken that it, for him to go there, the time taken to call the elders to him was less, plus there was the possibility of renewed rioting if Paul went to Ephesus. Verse 18, And when they were come to him, we're talking about the elders of the Ephesians, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, Ephesus thought to be located in Asia Minor, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons or all times. Paul's saying, or about to tell them, I was a straight shooter with you at all times. 
I didn't try and fluff things up. When, when you were in need of chastisement, I chastised you. When you were in need of praise, I praised you. And he did, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears, many of them for the Ephesians, and temptations, this is trials, which befell me by the lying in wait, this means the plotting of the Jews. And again, we have got some Kenites mixed in against the Judeans. You know, they plotted against Christ. They plotted against Paul. They plot against you and me today, those who take the truth forth. And now, and how, I kept back nothing. This is a a medical term that means this when food is held withheld from a patient and this again puts Luke's being a medical doctor thumb mark on um, being the author of the acts that was profitable unto you and have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house I've taught you in the churches I've, I've taught you in the streets publicly uh, even in your own homes I have come to teach testifying or witnessing both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, being the Gentiles, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The commission of Paul is written in Acts chapter 9 verse 15 to take the word forward not only to the children of Israel but to the Gentiles and the kings as well. And now, behold, I go bound, Paul had no choice in this matter, in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. And Paul always, from the time he was struck down on that road to Damascus, always obeyed the Spirit. Do you obey the Spirit when the Spirit is leading you? I hope so. Save that the Holy Spirit witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, or wait for me, this could be translated. And you know, if you ever feel like you're persecuted as a Christian, look to Paul. I mean, this man took beatings, he was shipwrecked, nights out on the open waters of the seas. Uh, over and over he was placed in prison. But guess what? He was a chosen vessel, and God knew he could count on him, and he knew that Paul could cut it. You're a chosen vessel, and God knows that you can cut it as well. But none of these things move me. None, none of these things bothered me, is what Paul's saying. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, Paul would go so far as to say, you know, if I had my druthers, to, to be absent from this flesh body is to be present with the Lord. If I had my preference, guess where I'd rather be, folks? I'd rather be with the Lord. But he had work to do. He had that ministry that Christ placed upon him. We have work to do as well. So that I might finish my course with joy. The texts omit the words with joy here. And ten years later, indeed, the ministry of Paul would be completed. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. His ministry to teach the gospel. This one that for the beginning of his ministry was what? He was so up to his neck with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and his studies with Gamaliel, he couldn't see that this was Messiah that had arrived. And he persecuted the Christians. But boy, how did God use this one afterwards? And now, behold, I know that ye all, the Ephesians, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more in the flesh. A sad day for the Ephesians. I mean, again, they loved Paul because he told it like it was. When, when they needed to be corrected, he was right there with his letters to correct. 26. Wherefore I take you to record this day. In other words, this is witnessed by you yourselves, that I am pure from the blood of all men. I haven't hurt anyone, I haven't offended anyone. For I have not shunned, this means to hell back, 
to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I've shared everything that's been revealed with me by our Father at to this point, and He did. Take heed, this means beware. Therefore unto yourselves, he's talking to the elders of the Ephesians now. Do any of you consider yourself elders? And to all the flock, the sheep, over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That good shepherd paid that price for you and me. Check out this word feed in the Greek. It's pomeino. And it doesn't mean just feed. It means, means to tend as a shepherd. And again, notice this is the elders of the Ephesians here. He's saying you have a responsibility to feed the sheep. And not just feed them. And of course spiritually we're talking about feeding them God's word. What does a shepherd also do when he tends the flock? He protects the young, the gentle, those that are not able to protect themselves, which is most sheep if you look at it in a physical sense, but think spiritual. Verse 29, Paul continues, For I know this, this not maybe, I know this, Paul says, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, the false prophets, the false teachers, including the false prophet Antichrist, is coming. I know it, Paul says. Also of your own selves, even out of your own ranks. You talk about wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. We're talking about the very elders of the church. Out of your own group shall men arise, speaking perverse things. This means distorted things or misinterpreted things to draw away disciples after them, to draw young learners, young students away from the truth of God's Word. And I hate to see it, but every year at Passover and at Fall Fellowship, we see these wolves coming to prey on the young sheep. They promote themselves as being some great thing. If, you know, People that are great things don't need to promote themselves as something great. Always remember that. Someone that's blowing their own horn is usually blowing smoke. Okay? But we see them coming to prey upon the young. We always warn the young, you know, if you go into these meetings, you put on your discerning ears because these people are not associated with Shepherd's Chapel. They're not associate pastors of Shepherd's Chapel. Put your discerning ears on, and if it sounds like trot, it's trot. Check them out. What did Christ say? Matthew chapter 7. A good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit. 31. Therefore, watch, be alert, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, listen up. I commend you to God. Paul's saying, I've taught you all I know. Everything I can tell you, I have told you. Done all I can do. Now, what does he do? What you should do when you've done all you can do. Turn it over to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. You ever need any edifying Friend, the Word is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Don't let anyone steal your crown of glory, your inheritance. Don't let the wolves steal your inheritance. Be concerned about your brothers and sisters' inheritance as well, because the wolves want it. Paul continues, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. I haven't asked you for silver or gold or clothing. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands, referring to his own hands, have ministered or served unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Paul 
by profession was a tent maker. He worked besides teaching and writing the letters that make up most of the New Testament. He worked as a tent maker to provide for his own needs and those sometimes that traveled with him. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. That's the humble or the poor, the young Christians you could think of. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Christ said too in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Freely you have received, freely give. What we're talking about here is spiritual now. When you have received truth of God's word, as it says in other places in the New Testament, don't put your candle under the bed or under a bushel, under a basket. When you receive truth from God, share it with your brothers and sisters that are lost in this world of darkness. That's the only way you're going to receive more truth. I'll tell you what, I've seen it. God can give someone a little bit of truth, and they clam up with it and think, well, I can't share this with other people. I better hold on to it because there's probably no more where this came from. Wrong. Where'd the truth come from? From your heavenly Father. He gives to all men abundantly as long as you give it to others as well. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. Prayer binds us as brothers and sisters together. Prayer binds us with our Heavenly Father. And they all, the Ephesian elders, wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. They loved him dearly and would miss him. Difficult to say goodbye. 38. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him under the ship. Paul would not return, uh, but the word would go on forever and ever. What's the point there in Acts that I think we should get out of that? The wolves are in the world. That's a fact. Paul said, I know they're coming. He's leaving. What does he tell them to do to protect themselves against the, wo the, the wolves? Edify yourselves in the Word. Don't overlook that. Though I commend you, he said, to God and to the Word of grace, which is able to build you up, meaning able to edify you. One of the last things that Christ said to the one he would chosen to be the shepherd of the new church. You know who I'm talking about, right? Peter. Christ knew he was not going to be able to do it. He gave it to Peter. What were Christ's last instructions? Some of them to Peter. And this is going to be brief. We're about done. Turn with me to John chapter 21, verse 15. This is after Christ had been crucified. And he's come back. And this is very special, I think, to Peter. And I hope it's very special to you as well. John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, you knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. This loveth thou me more than these, what I think Christ is referring to there is Matthew Chapter 26, verse 37, where Peter would say, Lord, though I die with you, I would never deny you. Remember, he denied him three times. This word feed in the Greek is bosco, and it means to pasture. It simply means to feed. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, bar Jonah in the Greek, Lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now check out this in your strong. Not bosco in the Greek. This is the word we saw in Acts chapter 20. Pome eno. And it means to tend as a shepherd. Not only included in that is feeding them spiritually with the word of God, 
protecting them, protecting the young. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Three times, why? How many times did Peter deny Christ? Three times, though he said, though I die, I would not deny you. Peter was grieved. He was distressed. I mean, what, what do I have to do to convince Christ that I love him? Because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. The one that would start the church, Peter, instructed by Christ what he wanted him to do. You be a shepherd to those sheep because I know that there are going to be wolves. I know those wolves, the false prophets, are telling people, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're not going to be here. You're going to be raptured out of here. There's going to be false prophets that are teaching the people on the highest Sabbath of all, Passover, to go out here in the groves and roll your Easter eggs and be quick with the bunny, fertility, spring pagan festivals. They're wolves, all right. And we have a responsibility. Uh, what is the name of our church? The Shepherd's Chapel. And folks, you know, it's working. We're reaching folks by the thousands. The newsletter that we're going to be mailing out this month let me back up and give you a little history so you'll know the, the uh, impact of this. December of last year, we mailed out 46,000 newsletters. That's to people who are active. That means we've heard from them in the last six months. This month, we mailed out 70,000 newsletters. That means from 46,000 to 70,000, we've heard from these people this year. This ministry is touching people's lives, and you have a part of that. You have a reward in that. So feed my sheep. Let's go to the throne. Yahweh Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you, Father. Help us to feed the sheep, Father. We know they're hungry. We see them starving to death in this world of darkness, Father. Be with us as we go about to accomplish thy work. We're always careful to give you the praise. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father.